On this Friday night, growing calls to search a Manitoba landfill for murdered Indigenous women. Winnipeg police say it can't be done, but a retired cop says it's been done before. By the time we were done, we had actually gone through more material than did the World Trade Center. Healthcare cash, the provincial pleas, and the Fed's ultimatum. A badly needed boost, the new shot in the arm approved for Canadian kids. Plus, he's not a mean one. The Grinch who stole Santa's thunder, powwow dancing on a Saskatchewan First Nation. Global National with Farah Nasser. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Operations at a Winnipeg area landfill have now stopped while officials there consider whether and how to search for murdered Indigenous women who are believed to be buried there. The task is monumental, involving acres of land, but it wouldn't be the first case to see police comb through such a large area. As Melissa Ridgen reports, the investigation is also sparking speculation about whether more victims might be buried there. This is the Prairie Green Landfill, believed to be the resting place of at least two murdered Indigenous women, and advocates fear there may be more. But they don't want this to be anyone's final resting place, demanding a search to give the women dignity and their families closure. Winnipeg police believe the bodies of Morgan Harris and Mercedes Myron are somewhere in a four-acre area here, under at least 40 feet of heavy construction mud, animal remains, and asbestos. It's not known where the body of an unidentified woman is, but yet another victim, 24-year-old Rebecca Contois, was discovered after a month-long search at a different landfill. Prairie Green has stopped operations while politicians figure out how a search would take shape. Given the fact that uh, the community has just come through the residential school system and the unmarked graves, we have to be sensitive to that. It's far from the first time investigators would face an exhaustive search in a homicide case, each with unique challenges. They're going to have to gather the people together that know what they're doing and uh, know how to do this. We relied heavily on academia. We had 102, I think, students come in to help out. And so you're going to have to be organized with the people and the qualified people to come in to do the work. Meanwhile, missing murdered Indigenous women and girls advocates say they're looking into other missing women who might be unknown homicide victims. It's suspected that the man accused of killing these four Indigenous women was targeting homeless shelters. Global News spoke with his estranged wife. I had gone to asylum um, of struggling with uh, drug addiction at the time. Um, and I was waiting to get a bed. He sat down beside me and he was, uh, seemed to be, you know, like a nice, friendly person. I made the choice instead of staying for a bed at Salon Mission to go home or go to this apartment, uh, which became my home after. We do believe, um, and we are looking into if there is any other women uh, missing and who they are, and if they were someone who accessed the shelter systems. We want to ensure that there is no other women that could potentially be in that landfill, and we suspect there could be. Melissa Ridgen, Global News, Winnipeg. Police in Toronto have identified the woman killed in what they're calling a random stabbing at a busy subway station. 31-year-old Vanessa Kurpuska died in hospital after a man stabbed her and another woman yesterday. The second woman was injured but has since been released from hospital. A 52-year-old suspect was arrested at the station. Police say he did not know the victims. A warning tonight about a major data breach involving Ontario's vaccine management system. The provincial government is notifying about 360,000 people that personal data, including names and phone numbers, was stolen back in November of last year and potentially given to fraudsters. Two people have now been charged. The province insists the booking system is monitored regularly and is secure. The B.C. government has launched a flu vaccine blitz focusing on children. More walking clinics open today across the province and will run through the weekend. Six deaths have now been linked to influenza among children and youth in B.C. this season. B.C.'s top doctor says the unusual pattern has prompted officials there to begin providing weekly updates on pediatric flu-related deaths. 
Canada's premiers are demanding the federal government do more to help struggling children's hospitals. They're calling for an urgent meeting with the Prime Minister early in the new year to discuss funding. The provincial and territorial leaders say they're paying a disproportionate amount for health services and the costs are skyrocketing. Now, for its part, the federal government says it's open to increasing the Canada health transfer. So, what's the sticking point? Mackenzie Gray joins us now with more. Mackenzie. Jeff, all sides agree there is a health care crisis, but the solution has come back to an age-old fight. The Premier's demanding more money for health care, the federal government only willing to cough it up if they play by Ottawa's rules. What we're calling for today is just a meeting to sit down with the Prime Minister to have the discussion about a fair uh, and sustainable funding for the future of health care in our country. All 13 premiers demanding a meeting with the Prime Minister to discuss their health care proposal. An increase of $28 billion annually to the Canada health transfers with no strings attached. It's a deal Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos won't even entertain. A plan to send unconditional transfers to, health, to, to finance ministers is not a health plan. Ottawa says they're willing to give billions to the provinces, but they want it spent on sectors like long-term care and mental health. Plus, they want the provinces to do a better job of sharing health data. Objectives do close, as provincial health ministers are on board with. Now we need premiers to let us do our job and express publicly the type of outcomes and results that we need to achieve together. While the political debate continues, the triple threat of RSV, influenza and COVID is straining a health care system already grappling with a massive staffing shortage. The latest sign of collapse? A record number of children being transferred by air ambulance in Ontario. In November alone, 140 pediatric patients switched hospitals via Orange Air Ambulance, with plans now being made to potentially move patients to New York State or Michigan. I think it's not uh, a large secret that there seems to be a, uh, a significant um, uh, strain on the system with regard to respiratory illness, specifically amongst pediatric patients. In Ottawa, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario has called in the Red Cross to help, and a pediatric hospice in Calgary has temporarily closed sending staff to a local children's hospital. Everyone feels overwhelmed and the system is overwhelmed. Uh, you know, there's uh, just massive demands on all aspects of the system. Duclos wouldn't say if the prime minister would meet with the premiers, and that's because the federal government could be changing their strategy on health care, with Ottawa trying to sign unilateral deals with provinces instead of negotiating with them as a group. Jeff? Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thanks. And parents now have a new tool to help protect their children against this overwhelming respiratory illness season. Health Canada has just approved a new COVID-19 bivalent booster for Canadian kids. The move now enables children aged 5 to 11 to receive the Pfizer-BioNTech booster shot designed to protect against the more infectious BA4 and 5 Omicron subvariants. Health Canada says the dosage, one-third the amount given to those aged 12 and up, was found to be safe and effective for the younger age group. Quebec's legislature has passed a law ending the requirement for members to swear an oath to the king. The new law comes days after three elected Parti Québécois members refused to swear the oath and were then barred from entering the assembly room. Previously, Quebec members of the legislature had to swear two oaths, one to the people of Quebec and another to the Crown. The oath to the Crown is now optional. Ukraine's Ministry of Defence is taking to Twitter to thank Canada for its help with the war effort. With a familiar soundtrack from Canada's Bachman-Turner Overdrive, the video says thank you for Canadian shipments of military supplies and, yes, long underwear. And those extra layers are key as a brutally cold winter takes hold. Ukrainian soldiers are now engaged in some of the most intense battles of the war near the eastern city of Bakhmut. Meanwhile, the diplomatic war between Russia and the West is also intensifying, with Canada and the Kremlin announcing new sanctions. Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gomancing reports. In the woods around Bakhmut, Ukrainian infantry troops are digging in. Battles in the besieged Donetsk region have fresh ferocity, with Russian and Ukrainian troops just 100 meters apart in some places. Здравствуйте, друзья. 
This volunteer says he made it to the ice-crusted grounds of the city. He describes fires and constant explosions. Thursday, he was handing out food and imploring residents to leave. This woman expressed love and gratitude, but stays. For systematic human rights violations against Russians opposing the war in Ukraine, Canada just sanctioned 33 current and former Russian officials, a move that led Moscow to summon Canada's ambassador. Meanwhile, Ukrainians face inconceivable violence day in and day out. There was a very loud noise. I barely managed to close the doors and get the children before the ceiling started to crumble, the walls as well. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak spoke with Ukraine's president, assuring him more defensive weapons are on the way. In his nightly address, Vladimir Zelensky thanked the UK for its support and expressed the challenges faced by those on the front lines in the east. In an effort to continue its bloody war on Ukraine, British officials accuse Russia of cozying up to Iran. Russia is now attempting to obtain more weapons, including hundreds of ballistic missiles. In return, in return, Russia is offering Iran an unprecedented level of military and technical support. Russia denies that allegation, just as Iran denies selling kamikaze drones to the Kremlin after the February invasion. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Russia's war in Ukraine is largely to blame for a surge in the number of journalists killed on the job in 2022. In a new report, the International Federation of Journalists says 67 media workers have been killed around the world so far this year. That's 20 more than all of last year. 12 deaths in Ukraine made that country the most dangerous, but rising violence in Haiti and Mexico are also being blamed for the spike. The group also says that at least 375 journalists are currently imprisoned because of their work, with the most in China, Myanmar and Turkey. Fresh frustration in the fight to resettle Afghan refugees. Coming up, the cap Canada is now imposing. When the Taliban reclaimed control of Afghanistan in the summer of 2021, tens of thousands fled the country, but many others could not and have been trying desperately to escape ever since. Canada has welcomed more than 25,000 Afghans since the Taliban takeover, and it recently quietly launched a new program to help those without documents. But as Nithu Gacha explains, the temporary program to sponsor Afghan refugees has been stopped just weeks after it started. When the Taliban recaptured Afghanistan in August of 2021, Canadians wanted to help those fleeing for their lives, and thousands remain at the ready to support asylum seekers. We as a committee have all the resources to be able to support this family. We just need the help to get them here. But there's a big obstacle. In order to be privately sponsored, the Canadian government requires most Afghans who fled to other countries like Pakistan and Iran to have official refugee recognition from that foreign state or from the UN High Commission for Refugees. Though they meet the definition of a refugee, official status is something very few Afghans are able to obtain, in part because with that status comes protections from states that are often unwilling to provide them. We've been working with them for over a year. That's why so many sponsors like this church group in London, Ontario, jumped at a temporary federal program that launched on October 17th, waiving the need for that official refugee status, as long as they meet the Canadian government's criteria to be privately sponsored. So we were scrambling um, over the last six weeks to get our, our applications together. But in those six weeks after it launched, the program reached its cap of 3,000 refugees, leaving many, like Stephen Watt, frustrated and wondering why an arbitrary limit exists when the need is so high. It's a crushing blow to many, many people across the country who are still preparing these applications because it's their only hope to get people out. We know it filled up. 20 minutes, half an hour in, messages came that the inbox was full. 
So we know there was a high demand. Farkanda Rajabi coordinates an Afghan response initiative in BC. From Afghanistan herself, she came to Canada in 2017 as a refugee, having been targeted for her work as a prominent women's rights activist. We um, hope that uh, the government could ease of the um, requirement for these refugees. Together, these groups are calling on Ottawa to remove the cap, but Immigration Minister Sean Fraser told Global News that's not happening. We don't currently have plans to extend it to uh, further numbers because it, uh, it, it would eat away at the allocations that are already committed to other groups who are working to sponsor people as well. Funds are being uh, raised by, by their family and friends and other caring volunteers. Uh, it's not coming out of the government's pocket. Uh, so I don't know why you would... Uh, handicap it with with a limit like this. These groups now trying to partner with others across the country to continue appealing to the feds to accept applications under this temporary program for a full year. Neetu Garsha, Global News, Vancouver. Critical minerals still ahead. The new plan to power Canada's transition towards green technology. Ottawa is facing pressure to speed up its regulatory decisions on critical minerals if the government wants to meet its climate goals and keep up with the growing demand for green technology. The Natural Resources Minister says the minerals are essential to power Canada's transition away from fossil fuels. Eric Sorensen reports. Natural resources helped build Canada's modern industrial economy, and now the country's geologic abundance will be exploited to fuel a newer and greener economy. Ottawa plans to speed up regulatory approval for critical minerals used in everything from solar panels to electric batteries. The last federal budget committed almost $4 billion to a new strategy to help Canada keep up with international demand and competition. Simply put, there is no energy transition without critical minerals. Canada can choose to be a leader in the global economic shift, or we can let it happen to us. Across Canada, there are dozens of projects and mines in almost all provinces and territories. Canada's resource abundance totals 31 critical minerals, including priority minerals, lithium, copper and rare earth minerals, along with ores like cobalt, nickel and graphite. One of the most promising regions is the Ring of Fire in northern Ontario. And throughout the process, from exploration to mining to battery development to full-scale manufacturing and finally to recycling, Ottawa wants to cut red tape to get projects moving. Take the Ring of Fire. Critical minerals were discovered more than a decade ago, yet approval and eventual mining are still years away. Here the, the world is looking for Canadian resources and uh, right now the regulatory system uh, definitely gets, uh, gets in the way. But projects won't happen overnight. Many minerals lie in traditional indigenous lands. Projects will require consultation and partnership. The key to success in this sector will be finding mineral extraction or processing arrangements with First Nations that include meaningful benefits and free prior and informed consent. It is a tricky balance. Just this week, Ottawa and General Motors announced the country's first full-scale electric vehicle manufacturing plant. E-vehicles will help the climate, but the minerals they require must be mined where biodiversity is also at risk. And an emphasis on regulatory speed worries environmental groups. And I think a lot of the communities that are currently being affected by mining want uh, better uh, regulations, not a deregulation agenda. It's a balance Ottawa will try to get right to support a new and growing economy and still meet Canada's climate goals. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Up next, why bringing holiday cheer to Indigenous kids is a cinch when you're a dancer known as the Pow Wow Grinch. Welcome back. A little girl in California has just been granted a unicorn license. Yes, you heard that right. Madeline made the request to LA's animal control authorities last month. She was sent a heart-shaped tag with the words permanent unicorn license, as well as a unicorn toy and certificate. Now the license states that if Madeline finds her unicorn, it must be given ample exposure to sunlight, moonbeams and rainbows and have its horn polished at least once a month. And good luck to Madeline in her search. As children count the days before Santa Claus makes his rounds, the Grinch has stolen Christmas hearts on a Saskatchewan First Nation. Chance Bear, also known as the Pow Wow Grinch, brings a unique First Nations flavor to the well-known Dr. Seuss character. 
And as Heather Yerkes West tells us, his touring performances are quickly becoming a beloved holiday tradition. Max! It was a little something that caught fire during the pandemic. During the, those COVID times, they weren't, you know, they were all in lockdown. So we decided to make this parade and go out to all the local First Nations. The Ochapaway's First Nations father of three first put on the homemade costume in 2017. But it wasn't long before word spread because Chance Bear's character was no ordinary Grinch. The powwow Grinch was distinctly Indigenous. It's such a, a joy to watch and to witness our culture coming into play through the Grinch. He definitely has stole Christmas from Santa Claus on a Chapaways Nation. A former powwow chicken dancer in his youth, Bear says he felt compelled by the Grinch to dance the cleansing grass dance instead. Is it because the Grinch kind of looks like grass? <laughs> Maybe the flow of the flow of the fur and all that. The dancing powwow Grinch has now become a fixture at Indigenous parties in South Saskatchewan, with dancing videos going viral, especially when the Grinch goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big guy himself. He actually put Santa to shame. <laughs> Bear juggles his Grinchy gigs during his furnace company's busy season because he says it's a labor of love an opportunity to spread joy and Indigenous pride during a time when everyone can use a little extra cheer. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Well, that story made my heart grow three sizes. That is Global National for this Friday. I'm Jeff Semple. Tonight, your Canada is Montreal, lit up for the holiday season. We love seeing your Canada, so please send your festive photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you back here again tomorrow. Have a great night.